Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 89. Today's quote will be spoken by the man himself, Tyler Durden. Advertising has us chasing cars and clothes, working jobs we hate so we can buy shit we don't need. We're the middle children of history, man. No purpose or place. We have no great war, no great depression. Our great war is a spiritual war. Our great depression our lives. We've all been raised on television to believe that one day we'd all be millionaires and movie gods and rock stars, but we won't. We're slowly learning that fact. We're very, very pissed off. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. The first rule of indie film hustle is you do not talk about indie film hustle. No, actually, the opposite is you talk completely and a lot about indie film hustle. But we're going to get to our guest in just one minute. So before we start, I want to, first of all, thank everybody who contributed to the This Is Meg crowdfunding campaign. It, it We hit our goal. We're now a little bit over 100%. And I couldn't have done it without the tribe and uh, all the all the people that helped us and uh, supported this crazy idea of doing this movie. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. We still, believe it or not, have over, as of this moment, over 10 hours left. And we do have a stretch goal. I uh, We added another 2000 to see if we can get a little extra money for sound post-production. Any little bit extra help is the one area of post-production I don't have control of is audio. I control everything else. I have an entire covered anything visually I can get done, but that audio has always been a little bit of a problem for me. So any little extra money would be amazing. So it's not too late. Head over to thisismeg.com, and we still have a ton of perks, especially access to the Indie Film Syndicate, as well as uh, all our courses, cool uh, autograph stuff by James Cameron and Guillermo del Toro. If you want to be on the podcast, there's uh, still uh, spots open to be a guest on the podcast, and so on. So that's thisismeg.com. Now, I want to talk about the last episode, episode 88 which is why the fuck are all filmmakers always so broke episode. And that episode has been by far the uh, most commented on and I've gotten the most love back from any podcast I've ever done or anything, honestly, I've ever done on Indie Film Hustle. It, um, I, I did it from a place of real love and passion and anger for my fellow filmmakers and I really hope it helps people and inspires them and based on the emails I've gotten from around the world I mean I've gotten stories from Sweden stories from South Africa stories from Europe from Australia and then throughout the US Canada even Brazil I mean I've gotten so much response it was overwhelming and it's I think the most retweeted podcast we've had as well as uh, commented on on Facebook and all the Facebook uh, pages we have. So thank you guys so much, and I really am glad that that hit a nerve with everybody, and I really hope it it helps people. So uh, if you liked it, please share it, because I'm going to promote that podcast as the podcast to listen to if you're going to listen to one episode of this series, Indie Film Hustle Podcast. That is the episode to listen to, because uh, it really... It really does shake shit up, if you will. (laughs) Now, I'm not going to start cursing left and right from from now on, okay? So don't worry. Uh, Today, I threw a couple curses in because, you know, we had Tyler Durden at the beginning of this this episode, which brings me to this amazing episode we got today. I stalked this poor man on Twitter for months until he finally decided to do the show. (laughs) And Jim Ools, who wrote... Arguably one of the best films in the last 20 years, Fight Club, and probably one of the best. It's, it's on my top five of all time. I think it's a, ma- a modern masterpiece and can be on the shelves with many of the classic films. And I think it will age very well as it has. That was released in 1999. And uh, if you put it on right now, it does not lose a beat. It is 
remarkable, uh, remarkable film. And Jim was a screenwriter on that. And he was able to take Chuck's book and uh, Chuck, the author, I won't say his last name because I can never say his last name, Chuck Palalakla, sorry. But uh, Chuck, uh, he took Chuck's book and made an unfilmable movie filmable. And him and David Fincher really worked out the kinks of getting the story onto the screen. And we talked for the first probably almost 30 minutes about Fight Club and all his experiences in Fight Club, how it got started, how he worked with Fincher, some inside stories, some fun stories of uh, how the whole process came out, what happens after the movie came out, and and so on. And it is so enlightening. And that's part one, kind of the first half of the interview. The second half of an interview is, I'm, and I use this word a lot, but this is really kind of a master's class in screenwriting of how he works in screenwriting, how he does things in screen, like how he his process is. But the the most amazing thing I've ever heard for screenwriters, and um, and I think uh, you can apply this to directors and filmmakers as well, is in the last part of the interview. He dishes out this amazing advice for film for start screenwriters who are just starting out, and the simplicity of his suggestion is so profound that is easily the greatest piece of advice I've ever heard for a screenwriter. So definitely wait till the end. There is so so many knowledge bombs being dumped on you guys in this episode. So you'll want to listen to this more than once. Jim is a pleasure. He was so much fun to talk to. It was just like two guys sitting down over coffee and just, you know, shooting the shit and it was really 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 uh, a pleasure and a thrill to talk to the writer of one of my favorite films of all time. And at the end of the episode, uh, if you guys stay until after the end of the episode, I'll give you a link to Jim's online course on how to write a screenplay. It's called the Screenwriter's Toolkit. It's a, a great, great course. I've taken the course, and Jim is awesome. Really, really, really awesome. And it definitely has a different perspective than other film, uh, other screenwriting courses I've taken. So it's definitely something you should check out. So I'll give you that link uh, at the end of the episode. So I'm not going to babble on anymore. Please enjoy my interview with Jim Ools. I'd like to welcome to the show Jim Ools. Thank you, man, so much for taking the time out to uh, to share some knowledge and drop some knowledge bombs to the uh, the Indie Film Hustle tribe. Oh, you're welcome. It's uh, I've been pressured. I mean, it's it's a pleasure to uh, <laughs> to be on the show. <laughs> well, I have I have stalked you on Twitter, so yeah, <laughs> that's a. Uh, that's how we got. That's how I got a hold of you. So uh, it's, a, yeah, it's very effective to stalk on Twitter. You know, it is, apparently it is. I've gotten. Uh, you'd be amazed at the people I've gotten on the show purely because I've, I've stalked them on Twitter. So Twitter <laughs> is pretty powerful. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> so Jim, I wanted to get started. I want to take you back to the beginning of it all. I know all the way back when you were a small child. No, um, when when did you get started in the business, and how did you get started in the business? Like, what brought you to this crazy carnival that we call the film industry? Well, I at UCLA, I got a, a combination degree that was uh, both playwriting and screenwriting, mm -hmm. and I I entered it as a playwright with some plays as a background. Uh, you know that I wrote, you know, after high school and early college. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I was like um, thinking, well, I'll look into both of them. I'll study both of them. And uh, it was a great uh, program to go through. And, I hear uh, it's a really great program, the UCLA program, especially uh, for screenwriters. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's still top notch. And um, so I was able to get plays done there at UCLA, which is more of an instant gratification than a screenplay, mm -hmm. which is... Um, you know, you write it and, and you hope. <laughs> <laughs> 15 years later, maybe something yeah, will happen. <laughs> so, uh, so I was able to see actors doing my stuff and all that, and it was great. Um, and uh, a bunch of us, you know, we went out into the world after that, and um, some friends of mine, you know, had connections and got agents, and then that's how I got an agent. And for, for quite a while, I was, uh, he was using a couple of my sample screenplays to seek out work for me and I have got work here and there rewriting work. I sold a screenplay. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't get made, <laughs> but, um, something I hear a lot of in the business that there's a lot of sc big screenwriters I've talked to. They're like, 
yeah, I've I, I've sold a ton of screenplays, and not many of them have been made. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Well, in my case, I was paid to write them, right? And then they didn't get made. That's what started to happen after after I sold one. I got it. But uh, either way, they didn't get made, so they ended up in the same pile. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, and then uh, one of my um, spec scripts, was, which was about a very incendiary, kind of funny but dangerous relationship with this uh, man and this woman, um, it, had a, it had some heat on it. And um, it was used as a sample when Fight Club was going to be, uh, when it was being considered. Actually, what was happening is the book was in galleys and it was being rejected by every studio in town. Mm -hmm. When a friend passed it to me and said, I don't think this is going to be made, but (laughs) I think you should read it. (laughs) And so I I read it and I just was blown away. And I thought, yeah, this will, nobody will make this into a movie. It's too good. (laughs) (laughs) And it's, and it's a, I mean, it's a pretty, I mean, it's a pretty difficult, novel to translate to to the film medium i mean it, it's it's pretty pretty intense <laughs> to say the uh, least yeah at the time i was luckily luckily enough i was dumb enough to not know how difficult it was <laughs> and uh, <laughs> as orson welles says ignorance is the best form of confidence <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> and so i thought well even though it'll never get made if if somebody's hired to write it I'd love to have that gig because it'd certainly be fun to be paid to do it, even even though there's no chance, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, of it being made, and so I, the uh, my sample basically got me the job. Um, I was acquaintances already with Fincher um, from a place called the Pad of Guys, which also had people. It's just a, it was just a place where people hung out. They were screenwriters, basically. Where the and, Pad of Guys. Yeah. <laughs> is that is the pad of guys still around? No, no. Okay. No. Um, but people like Shane Black were there and sure. Fred Decker. And so um, in any case, I um, it worked. The sample worked and I got I got basically I got the job. And um no, boy, was, that that, job. was that Fincher that got you the job? Or well, I mean they all decided basically together. Fincher, Laura Ziskin was running Fox 2000 and Fox main studio had already said no way, Mm -hmm. but Fox 2000 had a certain autonomy as a division and she wanted to make it. She was the only place in town that wanted to make it. And when she got Fincher on board, she got, I guess the really high up powers at Fox to say, you know, you can proceed with developing a script. And so now Fincher, so everyone understands where Fincher was at his career at that point. He had already made seven. Well, he did Alien Three, Seven, and then the Game. So no, the Game. No, actually, was the Game before or after? Well, Fight Club? Game wasn't. No, actually, that's an interesting part of the story. He hadn't made the Game yet. Um, oh, so it was right off of Seven then when this started being developed. Right, right. Oh. So he had made Seven, and it uh, it certainly made his deals from that point. A lot sweeter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, seven tends to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I started writing, and I was still writing the first draft when he called me and said, I'm going to go make a movie. Okay. And um, <laughs> so we went to make the game, and Fox had to actually, I mean, I was still going to finish the first draft, but in terms of my other steps, which were in the contract, you know, a rewrite and a, and a polish. They had to postpone those steps. Um, but I turned in, when I turned in the first draft, after really doing you know, a lot of my own internal drafts, like over and over and over and over again, sure. um, apparently I got it right. Uh, the studio was excited. Laura was excited. Fincher was excited. And the producers who, at the, when we began, Atman Entertainment was a combination of Josh Donnan and Ross Bell. And then Josh Donnan left that company and became an agent again. He had been before. Um, so it was just Ross Bell. And uh, the studio brought in, um, um, you know, another producer, Art Linson, 
to join. And so it was Art Linson and Ross Bell producing then also along with Sion Chafin, who was uh, Fincher's producing partner. So did so, fin- so when, when yeah. you guys were getting Fight Club off the ground, obviously Fincher's name helped a bit <laughs> to get the thing started. But I think from what I've read, because I've, I've, I've studied Fight Club immensely, it's, it's actually one of my top five films of all time. I mean, it's, oh. it's an absolute masterpiece. Right. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's, it, it really is. Anytime anyone asks me, I'm like, well, Seven and Fight Club are up there somewhere, up there with Shawshank Redemption and, you know, <laughs> and a couple wow. other ones and right. Blade Runner. <laughs> um, but, um, but from what I understand with Fight Club, I mean, the studio was going and going, but Brad Pitt really kind of took it over the top. At that point, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what took it over the top for the studio. They uh, well, uh, well, we've got Brad Pitt doing the film with David Fincher, and we're, you know. Yeah, and, then, and, that, and, that, and the way Hollywood thinks, like, well, they did Seven, and Seven was a hit. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. They love that pairing again. And um, and then another great idea, you know, and actually Art Linson, like, as I recall, had the idea, which was um, to, um, you know, the casting of, the non-named character, Jack, uh, to use Edward Norton, who at that time had his first year of movies coming out, mm-hmm. his first ones, he had three. <laughs> and they were all very different roles, you know. Yeah, he and, had an Oscar nomination off of um, Primal Fear, if I remember correctly. I, I don't remember, but I wouldn't be surprised. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in any case... Um, he, wasn't as, he wasn't a big star by any stretch yet. He was just, right, he was right, just getting right. out. But he had the kind of upward trajectory that was also very appealing to the studio and uh, everybody. We liked his acting chops, of course. And mm-hmm. So um, having, having him and then some, a great actor like Brad Pitt uh, really, really, you know, put it over the top. And Helena, I mean, Helena Bohem Carter was just, yeah. oh. I remember, you know, I was, I was, there were a lot of names of people that were kind of more like that urchin, you know, female waif type. Mm -hmm. Um, And David called me and said, what do you think about Helen Bonnet Carter? I just thought it was so high class. Like, wow, she'd she'd play that part? (laughs) (laughs) Like she was in Merchant Ivory movies. Like what's... (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, she'd been in a Woody Allen movie where she was playing someone that was a sort of a a tough American character and... um, uh, you know, she clearly could do anything, really. You know, uh, I, I so I was just amazing. That sort of like brought up sort of the um, the art level of the whole thing, <laughs> right? Except all of a sudden, you had some art house cred. Yeah, <laughs> it's not just a, a big studio movie. Now, the casting of that movie is is brilliant across the board. I mean, Meatloaf and uh, Jared Leto and all these, like how. I mean, I mean, you obviously were pretty close to the production. Obviously, you just didn't write a script and went away. You were pretty close. If I'm, am I correct? Yeah. Well, I mean, he showed me. Um, he showed. We sat down, the two of us, uh, David, and showed me the first half of the rough cut. Rough cut mm-hmm. You know, on his home theater system, and um, my jaw was just on the floor. You know, it's like everybody was right for their roles. Everything looked and sounded and was like it. everything that I imagined it, you know, I, I was just floored by it. How, fr- how, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Oh, that's all. No, no. How, how much freedom did both you and David have during the making of this? I mean, cause this does not seem like a studio movie. I mean, there is a lot of stuff that would have normally been nixed off of a script and never even gotten to a production stage. How much freedom did you guys have, and did you have a lot of battles um, that you can talk about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that I can talk about. Well, I mean, all I know is um, that there certainly was a lot of freedom uh, afforded uh, Fincher, and I know that both he and um, you know the other producers and uh, Art Linson would talk about having conversations with the studio. And, <laughs> You know, say, well, their eyes were kind of like this when I said that, so I don't know. <laughs> but they, um, you know, they managed to keep it uh, protected, really, the whole way through. Um, I know that in the middle production, um, you know, I, this this story has been told, but um, 
Laura Ziskin didn't want the line, and it's it's a line from the book that oh, I know, and I, I think that, I know which line you're talking about. <laughs> I want to have your abortion, and oh. I don't I don't really want that line. It was actually David came up with the substitute. Um, I haven't had sex like that since grade school. And yeah. <laughs> Laura said, can we t- change it back to I want to have your abortion? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> which, which was not changed back. Though. No, I mean, but the, but that other line does work quite well in the movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I know. I, remember, I think I heard that story in an interview with David, too, that he, was, he said that. I was like, that's such a great line. He is a very – he's a dark human being, isn't he? <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, what really what I would say about this is, is he fires on all cylinders. I mean, he. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. He had a reputation up to that point. I mean, it started to change with Seven, which was such a great character. Oh, and, uh, yeah. Performances and meaty drama and all that and suspense and um but you know he'd been labeled a visual guy i mean yeah. he he's everything character story humor tech dramatic moments mm-hmm. uh you know the whole thing he's he really has a comprehensive grasp of making a film he is a comp- he is a, a, a contemporary to um to kubrick in many ways i know he is a a, a devotee of kubrick's from what I from uh, what I've read, what's well, interesting you brought that up because when I first read the galleys of Fight Club, when I was finished, I kept thinking Clockwork Orange. Oh, and that was part of why I was thinking this will never be done. You know, here yeah. <laughs> by a major studio in the United States, I was like, no, it's not going to happen. But that, I, I I always kept thinking of Kubrick the whole way through um, because I, I feel like Fight Club is is definitely something that is in a, uh, the same line of films that go back to Clockwork Orange. Right. I was I actually, uh, probably about a year ago, I had watched Clockwork Orange again, and I hadn't seen it in, God, probably a decade. And my mouth was on the ground. I just, could, I forgot, like, within the first 20 minutes, <laughs> the, <laughs> the stuff that Kubrick got away with. I'm like, my God, if this movie comes out today, it would cause... An insane amount right. of controversy. Today, right. I can only imagine what it did in the 70s. So um, I think Fight Club is uh, is definitely deserves a place on that mantle without question. Uh, because there's stuff in Fight Club that you just go, how did this get through? Like, how did this get made? <laughs> Intercutting, <laughs> I mean, I think that was the first male penis, male, any penis I've seen. Male, yeah. On, male, as I on a studio movie. Like, <laughs> you know, I remember seeing it at like, the AMC. I was like, did they just flash a penis on the screen? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> now, um, let me ask you, um, when what's your process to adapt something like this? Like what was your, you know, it, it was like a lot of people said it was almost impossible to adapt into a, into a, into this medium. So what was your process as an adapting, uh, th- not only this, but other, other, um, like other material into the, the medium of film? Like what was your process in this for Fight Club specifically? Well, um, to start with, I wanted to say that it's very interesting, but uh, Ross Bell had someone type the novel as a screenplay, and it was 500, 600 <laughs> pages, and it was just insufferable. You couldn't, because you, you wanted to like read parts of it with actors. Right. And it was just like, well, you obviously can't do it that way. That's not how you adapt <laughs> the novel. To- yeah, the Godfather was, would have been. He wasn't doing it for that pages. purpose, he just wanted to have some actors read parts of it and stuff like that. But it was just interesting to see. It was a very vivid way of seeing that you cannot just turn a novel into a screenplay. So um, I, I knew that what everybody wanted at the end of the line um, when I turned into first draft was a screenplay, a screenplay that everybody would want to make. And um, that was the overriding priority. It has to be a screenplay. It has to work as a screen story. Um, And um, fortunately, I sort of stylistically sort of melded with Chuck Polinick and um, put in the stuff where I put in my own material. It seemed to mix with where I was using stuff from the book. But the main thing was is that structurally – I had to put together something that worked as a screen story. 
Um, and I would take the book and go through and use a highlighter to highlight all the stuff I, I want to use. I want to use this. I want to use that because the book has got a lot of stuff and mm-hmm. it can't all go into the movie. Right. So um, I would I would do that and then sort of use that as a guide and then sit down and stare at a blank screen for hours on end and be full of fear. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but um, it's interesting that sometimes writing um, scenes that feel like they're like you felt when you read those scenes in the book, writing them differently than they are in the book is what it took to make it seem like it was from the book. It was actually the changing that made it seem more like it was from the book. It was an odd thing. Um, But I think that's one of the parts of adaptation is to convey the spirit of the book sometimes means you're changing something. Got it. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, because I mean, I remember when I first watched the first Harry Potter, <laughs> I'm like, well, they skipped that part and they skipped that. Part. I'm like, well, come on. <laughs> right, right. I mean, enough's enough. But uh, ab- absolutely. Now, how um how involved was David? Um, oh, first of all, how involved was Chuck in the in your process, or did you talk to him at all? Yeah, yeah. David and I brought him down a couple times, um, and we. The first time we just hit him with all these questions. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? And Chuck would say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then we said, yeah, for instance, the scene in which um, Tyler is driving the car and swerving into headlights mm-hmm. while he's forcing, we call the narrator Jack. He's never called a name in the movie mm-hmm. or, you know, in the dialogue of the script at all. But we had to put a name down. So we put Jack down. Um, when Tyler's forcing him to answer questions and threatening to have a car accident. Well, in the book, it's not Tyler. Um, it's just another one of the Project Mayhem space monkeys driving. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we said, why wouldn't it be Tyler? And Chuck goes, uh, wow, that's, that's a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he was also great. He also did clarify a lot. I don't want to make it sound like it was all like that. He did clarify a lot, and uh, he also was extremely supportive. Uh, he had no official, um, you know, attachment to the project, but mm-hmm. in this casual, friendly way, he was he was just a wonderful presence, supportive, informative, and we did get a lot out of having him around. He is an interesting uh, soul. Oh, he is <laughs> totally fascinating. I mean. Really, he's so multi-layered. I could just do a separate interview about him. Except I, couldn't, I probably <laughs> I'm, couldn't I'm, say I'm, a lot of the stuff I know. <laughs> well, it's like it's the it's the whole. Um, I mean, just look at his body of work. I mean, you look at someone's. You know, you look at an artist's work. You can kind of creep a little bit into the into the soul of that person. And um, if Fight Club is any indication, <laughs> <laughs> or Choke, or any of the other books he's written, yeah, yeah, um, they're into his soul for sure. Uh, yeah, and they are making. They made a, a sequel to Fight Club up in comics, right? Yeah, that was Chuck's project. He wrote it, and an artist uh, did the artwork, <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, yeah, that was interesting. Um, I also wanted to tell you. Yeah. Um, I actually don't know if you know this, Alex, but. Yeah. Um, I'm writing a pilot uh, based on his second novel, Survivor. Oh, uh, really? It, to be a t- pilot for an ongoing series, we'll have to change the name, of course, because of the reality show. Sure. But um, it's uh, his novel about a person who survived a religious cult. And um, then basically it focuses on the after that, and he becomes a cult leader of a, of a different <laughs> Of a different kind, you know, <laughs> more on the national circuit, more in, not, not, not on a compound like he was, but yeah. a guru, a thought leader going around, you know, uh, right. traveling and being on television and all that kind of stuff. A Tony uh, Robbins kind of guy. Yeah, right. Wow. <laughs> That's going to be – so hopefully on HBO or Netflix. 
<laughs> yeah, we don't. We you know um, we don't have. I'm the company's paying me, and we don't have the studio or the network yet. Okay. So um, hopefully, it's a network where you guys can kind of just flourish and not have to worry about. I don't. I don't know if that would work on network television. Hopefully, cable or or streaming. So you get oh, some it, would, it would. It would not be welcomed <laughs> in the doors of a network television broadcast. So, no, so much on NBC and ABC at this point. <laughs> <laughs> From the creator of Fight Club, come. <laughs> yeah, only if I like to have my ass hit steps as I bounce down out <laughs> the exit door would I try to go into a. a oh, club. that would be fun. That would be a fun interview to a fun uh, <laughs> meeting to watch, though. I'm sure. <laughs> So, uh, so how involved? So, obviously, Fincher was extremely involved in the screenwriting process with you, correct? Oh yeah, yeah. And you know, when I was doing the second draft and third draft, um, I go to his house. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, you know, for a few weeks before actually just going back to myself and doing the draft, we would have uh, these, you know, daily meetings and go through everything. And uh, he, it was just wonderful working with him. I remember by the time... Um, we were working on the end of the movie. He and I both got up and started, well, he could say this and he'd move over here and we're going all around his living room. <laughs> <laughs> like just having fun, like really yeah, creating. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> what, a, what a shock. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, creative people, you know how they are. Well, I've heard, well, I've heard that he's, he's uh, just br- brilliant in the sense of just he is so multilayered and he knows a lot about a lot. And yeah. uh, he's just one of those guys. Um, I saw an interview with Morgan Freeman who said that, that he's just like, his mind is a steel trap. It's just remarkable to work with, with, with him um, on anything. And, and obviously his career has flourished over the years. Yeah, right. <laughs> a bit. Yeah, it has definitely been a great career. Yeah. Um, so when Fight Club was released, it was not a huge hit when it first came out. Uh, it was yeah, kind of, domestically. Yeah. yeah, domestically. It's just kind of well, so. So was it a hit overseas? Well, by their standards, yes. By Actually, the studio standards. And I don't know if it was in all countries, but mm-hmm. it was, in, I believe, in England and, or the UK Makes and sense. some of the continental European countries it was. Um, but here in the state, I remember when it came out, people, I mean, it's a hard movie to market. No one really knew how to. Yeah, that was a really, you know, I mean, after Everything we went through and put it all together, and it's there it is, and it's just Fincher's really put together this wonderful thing. It was like, uh oh, marketing. How do you market this? <laughs> like, and I remember, I remember I mean, seeing I friends come up to. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I remember seeing the posters of it up in the in my local in my local theater, and I was like, oh, I'm going to go see that because I, I I knew who Fincher was, and I knew you know I wanted to see Brad and all that. But I'm like, wow. It, over the years, as you start analyzing, I'm like, man, that's a tough movie to sell. Like it's really yeah yeah yeah. I had friends come up, you know, maybe in the cu- couple weeks after it was released, and they hadn't seen it yet, and they said, "Oh yeah yeah, no, I'm going to see it. It's uh, what? It's about amateur boxing, right?" <laughs> and I just, oh my god, I just, I didn't know what to say. I was like, uh, "No, <laughs> no, it's not about amateur boxing <laughs> by by any stretch." <laughs> So when it so but it was obviously a movie that was a slow burn, um, and but it was very well received. Uh, uh, was it received well critically? I don't remember. Well, it was mixed, but okay. we did have some great champions like Janet Maslin of the New York Times, which is just a glowing review. Um, and the San Francisco and Chicago, we did pretty well. Um, not with the LA Times, <laughs> <laughs> oddly enough. And so it, it was mixed, which I kind of liked because. That made me feel like, well, that's right. It should be mixed. Yeah. Now, if everyone loves this movie, there's a yeah, problem I, with society. I, I, I feel like, well, wait a minute. What's wrong? With <laughs> Everybody's not supposed to love this. Exactly. So for you as a screenwriter, how was it like when this this beautiful thing that you guys put together came out and it was mixed and it wasn't a huge hit right away? Um, how did it feel for you as, I mean, this was at that point the biggest thing you had done, correct? Well, I well, it was my first produced film. Um, I um, the the mixed reviews I was excited about actually. I mean, I didn't like reading the negative ones. Of but course, I was really jazzed that it was mixed. The the box office that was um, disappointing. 
And then um, when it was released on DVD and those sales skyrocketed through the, you know, yeah. the stratosphere, I was just, it was so vindicating, you know, it was just validating. It was great. Um, mm-hmm. I've much of, I must have purchased at least four or five different special editions of that damn movie. <laughs> <laughs> so your residuals, you got at least a few cents from me, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so enough about Fight Club because God knows we've talked enough about that. But We're I could talk for hours about, about Fight yeah. Club. <laughs> <laughs> but can you tell me the craziest story that you can publicly tell us about working as a screenwriter in Hollywood? The craziest story. Yeah, just like, did that just really happen to me? <laughs> um, I think that probably, the, I mean, if, it, if it's really about being a screenwriter in those moments, I'd mm-hmm. probably say craziest thing is something really that I did, which um, I did it several times, which is when I was supposed to come in and pitch my take on doing an adaptation of something. Mm-hmm. I turned it into a, a full-on conversation with everyone in the room, and we all talked about it, and, and we had ideas about how you'd handle certain things and how you'd do it, and we'd have this long conversation. By the end of it, they go, great, and I got the jobs, but I never pitched. <laughs> you know, you just would walk in and like, all right, guys, so what do you guys think about this? And let's see this. Well, is- I, yeah, I wouldn't start with what do you think about it. I mean, that would be too much. You know, right. I would start off actually talking about some things I thought of. Right, but- first. Then I would bring them into a conversation, and um, it was great because I hate pitching. I hate pitching. You know, where I'm just talking from beginning to end, uh-huh. I hate it. But, of course, I've also done that, too, because there's been people that are not going to sit there and have a conversation. <laughs> you know? it's like, okay, what's the take, Jim? <laughs> got it. Got it. Yeah, pitching is not something – I mean, it's, a, it's an art form in itself. Yeah. Uh, and I know a lot of screenwriters who just don't dig it. <laughs> yeah. I even thought about hiring a real sales type guy to just do it for me while I'm sitting there. You know, That would be brilliant. <laughs> Can you imagine walking into a studio meeting? I'm like, who's that? That's my pitch man. <laughs> I'm just going to sit here. Oh, that has to go in a script somewhere. I mean, seriously, that is brilliant. <laughs> well, I mean, it's uh, – and the only reason it wouldn't work is they want to hear it from the writer. You know, unfortunately, it's a, it's a fantasy, but I don't think they'd, they'd go for it. <laughs> One day before before it's all said and done and you cash up you – know, you, you, you walk away, you should just do it for the hell of it. <laughs> Just oh, well, if, it, if it was right before I was going to walk away, there's a lot of stuff I would do in a meeting. <laughs> Some of it might be I get arrested for. But. Fair enough. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure you can tell some stories off air <laughs> that were pretty interesting, entertaining. Um, now you did do a you did have a formal education at uh, uh, arguably one of the best screenwriting schools uh, in the world. Um, do you think you need a formal education to uh, to be a, a successful screenwriter? Um, well, I mean, what helped about it is, is the roundedness of it, the breadth, breadth of courses and, you know, understanding a lot of different things about the world and studying a lot of different areas is certainly good mm-hmm. for any writer. But I wouldn't say you have to have that. I think you have to have some kind of, you know, professional class that really teaches structure and and everything else but i would think that's pretty important whatever form it takes but it doesn't have to be you know in the university system got it, got it. you can say, you can say it? go ahead oh no I, that was it <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> i have some i have a hallucination next to me who's sometimes murmuring you might hear it but uh, fair uh, enough fair, fair enough <laughs> Now, do you um, do you outline a story uh, before you write it? Well, I hate outlines. <laughs> I hate pitches. I hate outlines. <laughs> the reason I hate outlines is they're bloodless, lifeless um, statements of, you know, you put down, in this scene, this emotional thing happens. Oh, really? Well, great. Okay. You know, it's like it's a clinical, technical description of what the script is supposed to be. And people want it because they want to know what the script is going to be. But when they read it, they don't know what the script is going to be. They know what the technical description, this cold, clinical, 
uh, collection of statements is. That's all they know. Mm-hmm. And they can go, I don't know. I don't feel it. Well, of course you don't feel it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I haven't written it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have to do them. I mean, I haven't always had to do them. Uh-huh. Uh, but some projects you you have to do them. And um, I've just sort of cultivated getting better at making them seem to have feelings in them. Um, that's the the only way I can handle doing them. Um, now, now, in your opinion, uh, and there's a couple, there's two camps here uh, for for screenwriters and writers in general. Are you more in the character camp that drives a story, or plot camp, or both? We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. I, you know, it's funny. I, I think I am in the character camp, but it seems like that when I'm thinking about character, I'm thinking about the plot as well. Like, but be, it's because I'm thinking about the character. I mean, it's not only thinking about the character solely as filling out a whole human being and making them three dimensional and, you know, all the texture with them. I'm thinking about them doing things and going through stuff. So it's, it's, I would say it's definitely heavily character driven Mm -hmm. generated, but, um, I'm thinking about plot at the same time. Now, do you, how do you find the voice of a character, like as a writer? I mean, I know every writer is a little bit different, but how do you find your voice and your characters? Well, I'll put two of them together and I'll just start writing scenes. Um, I like to do what's, I call it writing outside the script. And there's various forms it takes. One is um, scenes that are, well, they are scenes that are not going to be in the script. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're just scenes that I put in any situation. And sometimes there are scenes that would come before the story of the script starts. Um, And sometimes I interview the characters where it's, you know, I type Jim and I type my first question. I type (laughs) the character name and the answer. And I try to goad them, provoke them, get them angry, then get them, you know, suddenly uh, talking, you know, sentimental way about some memory or something and then get them joking and laughing and basically just get them all over the range with questions. And, um, you know, it starts off, it's, it's, it's very, very mechanical at first. Um, but they sort of start to come alive in an interview. Uh, it's interesting. When you were talking about that, I was thinking about, um, Charlie Kaufman's, uh, adaptation. <laughs> <laughs> pushing the character and asking the character. I just, for whatever reason, it's, as a writer, I, I, I love watching that movie. It's one of my favorite movies as well. Oh, yeah, that's a great one. That's yeah. a, it's such a brilliant... Again, that's one of those movies that's outside the box, without question. Well, anything, right. Anything Charlie right. writes is pretty much outside the box. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so um, you wrote plays before you got into screenwriting. How did that help you in your screenwriting craft? Well, I mean, that was, you know, it's, it's characters behaving and talking. Um, so that, that was the critical aspect of it that I carried over into screenwriting. Plays also have structure and you have to write to that structure and build it well. And you have to build scenes so that a scene has, what is the purpose of the scene? What's the event of the scene? And then what's the takeaway from the scene? And all that thinking in playwriting is, is, is this, are the same considerations you have in screenwriting. It's a completely different medium but in a different form because, of course, plays have long extended scenes and on the same set, you know, uh, before the set changes. If it does, some plays take place on the same set the whole way through. Um, mm-hmm. Screenplays go all over the place and scenes are short, but... Um, you still have those considerations. Why does this scene exist? Why is it in this story? What's the event of it? And what's the takeaway from it? And it's also writing characters who are alive and vivid and behaving and speaking and doing things to each other. 
Now you you spoke about structure. What is your take on the like the hero's journey structure, the three act structure, the four act structure? What is there something that you kind of always gravitate to? What is your thoughts on structure in general? Because I think that's something a lot of screenwriters, especially young screenwriters or starting out screenwriters, kind of forget. <laughs> right, right. Well, I do basically go by the three act structure. It's um, you know, I mean, it, I mean, I may not slavishly follow it, but mm-hmm. it's basically what I uh, do with the structure. I mean, and the second act is, is the long act and it's a very difficult act to write. It's one in which um, the build really, you have to keep an eye on the bill. You have to make this thing continually um, raise the level of the adrenaline and the audience watching whatever type of, of story it is. Mm-hmm. I'm not just talking about thrillers or something, but I did have a professor once say to me something very interesting, which is when an audience starts to watch something, their tolerance is very high. Uh, and that tolerance, you know, for what they're watching, what, what's happening, decreases incrementally as time passes. So you can start off with anything happening, anything going on, and, you know, it, maybe it's mysterious and the audience doesn't really, you know, whatever. It's, it's the opening. You're kind of just getting into it. The audience is totally ready to, yeah, let's, let's do this. And then after a while, it's going to be, I, this better be going somewhere. You're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> he was absolutely <laughs> and, right. And that, that attitude of this better be going somewhere gets more and more pointed as time goes on. So that's one thing to keep in mind uh, when, when you it's, – it's, it's sort of a structural overview to keep in mind as you're going through the whole thing. Now, as a screenwriter and as a storyteller, you know, things that got, you got away with in the 80s – or you know, or movies that got things got away with in the 30s or 40s. You know, this audiences have become so much more sophisticated because of their bombardment of media and movies and stories that it's becoming harder and harder for screenwriters and filmmakers to really do something that surprises them or keeps them enthralled or or, or keeps them going. Uh, what is what's your feeling on that? Because I, I mean, things that 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 played in the 80s don't play today. Like you can't put you can't you you couldn't release Commando today. <laughs> you know in the in the 80s it was, it was well how this is great you know but now you'd be like mm, probably not gonna fly um so what what do you think of, what's your feeling on that well at, at this point movies have become basically two things tent poles you usually if not always based on pre-existing material that has audience recognition because that's the studio's you know clamor for safety in their investments mm-hmm and the other type of movie is the independent film or the independent like film that's actually being done by a, a division in a studio. Right. Uh, you know, I like think, you know, there's a term Washington insiders and Washington outsiders and everything. And I was the indie, indie film is outside the studio system, but the, uh, the independent divisions of studios is like, pretending to be outsiders while they're actually insiders you know right because it, because that's another that's another market that's like oh wait a minute let's get a piece of that market because there's, so, there's yeah, money to be made making independent films oh it's an independent film yeah yeah but we're putting it out you know yeah it's, look it's there's a there's a cool little logo it's not paramount it's paramount vantage it's right. different. <laughs> it's not the same it's fox 2000 it's not right, fox right. you know right right <laughs> But, you know, thankfully they're, they're doing it because that's another venue. But um, I think those are the two basically type, type of films. And the independent film, it's actually part of the, 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 the ethos of the financial model that it be successful critically um, yeah. and in festivals if, if it does go through the festival circuit. That's not the same commercial model for a tentpole. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, it better be making money, you know. Um, and so, um, independent films basically live or die by their quality, which, you know, it's it's actually a very exciting thing about them, I think. 
Well, yeah, I mean, there's a, like you know we're making our movie right now. Um, you know, you you know Jilly, the star of our movie, and we're making our little movie. And yeah, it's, yeah, she's she's tremendous. Yeah. yeah, and and you know we're making our little movie, and it's truly an independent film. <laughs> you know, Fox Two Thousand or Fox Searchlight is not doing anything behind the scenes. <laughs> um, you know, we raised our money, and we're you know we're making a small little independent film for a small market. Um, but the financial risk is slow, is low, extremely low, as opposed to Ghostbusters. Right. You know, right. which um, you know, after this last weekend that came out, um, as of this recording, it, it did not. Uh, it's not living up to the expectations of the studio. I'm, I'm, I'm from what I've read. Um, same thing with Independence Day. I mean, the, these big budget films that these tent poles that keep coming out that are there's a lot. There's been a lot of bombs this summer. Like, we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. A lot of bu- like big. Well, I mean, bombs. They, they like to, they use the word disappointment, and, and and I actually go along with that. I mean, a bomb is a bomb. I mean, that's like you know. Yeah, it, it cost two hundred million dollars, and it made f- five. That- <laughs> yeah, but but a disappointment is it's not as big a hit. And that that happens too, you know. I mean, I really enjoyed Ghostbusters. Okay. I, I have, I'm dying uh, to see it. So it was, it was a lot of fun, and um, but. You know, it, it, financial disappointment means well, we wanted it to make more. You know, that kind of thing. Exactly, exactly. Or Independence Day, for that matter, or the BFG, the Spielberg movie that uh, didn't do as well. Um, things like that. But do you believe in that whole uh, Hollywood implosion? That you know, th- there's going to be a moment that these studios are going to have. You know, let's say a studio puts out two or three tent poles, and they all financially just die or not do well. And that could it could cripple a studio because some of these I mean some of these movies are two hundred million, two hundred fifty million. I mean, look, the risk that they took on Avatar was massive back then, and right, uh, you know, right. I mean, that could have yeah, I mean, that could have done <laughs> that could have knocked Fox oh, no. out. I mean, it really could have hurt them really badly if that movie did not do what it did. But um, or if, imagine if Disney's four point five million dollar investment in Star Wars, which is obviously not a risk, but <laughs> If that that Star Wars movie didn't do well, my God! I mean, that could have really hurt Disney. <laughs> do you believe in that yeah. whole like Spielberg and Lucas said that there's going to be a Hollywood implosion at one point? That the studio system is going to take a big hit, and some of these studios are going to going to fall because they're just rolling the dice so much on these big big temples. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it is a possibility. It's definitely a possibility. I um, I don't know how many co production co. I don't know if what you call it. It's not really co-production. It's co-distribution distribution yeah. with two studios. I mean, that's been done in the past. I don't know how much they're trying, going to try to do that in the future. Um, it certainly is something that helps um, share the burden. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, it's a possibility. The implosion is could happen. Now, um, this is a this is a loaded question, but it's a question I, I'm just curious to see what you think of. What is the greatest challenge for a screen pl- a screenwriter facing and staring at a blank screen? <laughs> <laughs> Starting to type. <laughs> just the first word. <laughs> you know, I mean, really, I know it sounds like I'm I'm just kidding, but actually, I'm serious. Uh, sometimes I just make myself type. It's like, okay, I'm I'm tired. I'm not going to do this writer's block thing. I'm not doing it. So I just type. I just make myself type. I mean, I'm typing the scenes that, you know, a scene I'm supposed to be working on, but I, I just do it. I mean, there's a point in, you know, it's like they say with working out exercise, you know, just do it. That kind of, well, it's, it's really true. It's sit there and start putting your fingers on the keys (laughs) and typing. You may not feel a thing. You may feel like, oh, I just totally have no inspiration. I don't know what I'm going to type anyway. Mm-hmm. Just start typing. Because at some point, if you don't let yourself stop, you're going to get into it. Eventually. So you don't, you don't sit around waiting for that muse to come and tap you on the shoulder? Oh, no, no. That's, that's the road to writer's block, which is the, you know, that's... I look at that like a disease I don't want to get, you know. I never want to go into there because I've known people have been in there and they've been in it for months and months. It's like, no, I'm not doing it. 
I'll just type, I'll type gibberish if I have to, but I'm not going to get into writer's block. It's not going to happen. You just got to let the, you got to turn the hose on and whatever comes out, comes out. Exactly. Exactly. And eventually that water will turn into wine. (laughs) That's true. It will. If you just keep typing, it will. So you also created a, a remarkable course online called the Screenwriter's Toolbox. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, um, it's interesting. I when I first after I did it, I started to try to get some people to tweet about it and stuff like that. And they thought that I because I said it wrong. I said I did an online screenwriting course, and <laughs> I forgot that there are ones that take place in real time that are over. You know, right. <laughs> and that's not what this is at all. This is permanently there. It's a filmed lecture that's always there mm-hmm. that you can always get. So I want to make that clear first. <laughs> I'll make sure everybody knows the link to it. It will be in the show notes and I'll, I'll mention it in the podcast as well. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's meant to be the basics. So I cover the basics of, you know, format. Um, I cover the basics of style. And by that, I mean, you know, um, how you use things like going into a shot. Because screen, screenplays are supposed to be written mostly in the master scene format. Because you're not supposed to direct on paper. Mm-hmm. It's cut to his face, cut to his hand, yeah. show this, show that. You know, you're not supposed to do that. So I talk about using a master scene, but the, the permissible use of going to individual shots, you know. Um, and so that's kind of like handling the stylistic, the basic stylistic approach. And I talk about, you know, um, starting a scene late and ending early, which is you don't want to write every, you, you want the scene to be as short as it can be. And you want to start absolutely where it has to start and not before. Um, and you want it to end where it should end. And I, so that, that bring you know, that's part of that is what I call shoe leather, which is the stuff that really doesn't need to be in the script, you know, um, Hey, Alex, where's a pencil? Oh, it's in a drawer over there under the calendar. Oh, thanks. Uh, oh, yeah, I just opened the drawer here. Yeah, you're right. There's a pencil in here. Yeah. You know, no, I'm sorry. I've read that script. I've read that it script. It doesn't need to be in the script. <laughs> um, and you were talking about how audiences become more sophisticated. Part of that is we can, you can shortcut a lot more. Mm-hmm. Um, you can make transitions of cutting to a scene to something else without an interim um, – interval scene i guess you'd call it or a scene between them i mean you don't have to show him go to his car or walk in the building or mm-hmm. you know even more things you don't have to show you just go bam right from this scene mm, into the next one and the audience can follow because they're more capable of following a shorthanded film grammar now and so you've got to write that way um so anyway i you know i, I cover things like that in the uh, creative live uh, course that I did. Now, you, you, when you were saying that, the, one of the huge mistakes I've always seen in screenplays, and I'm, I've been uh, in my early screenplays, I was, uh, I was uh, guilty of it as well, is just telling everything and not showing. So, no, or, or, or being economical with my words, like you know, as, as opposed to two people. Hey, Jim, remember when we were uh, in high school? Hey, wasn't Mrs. What's her name's class great? She was hot. Like you, there's a much better way of saying that statement or getting that information across. Maybe in a couple words, or maybe even in a look, or maybe in something else. So the the economy of of that kind of information is something that is basically the screenwriter's job, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the hardest things that uh, we all face with it is exposition. You know, it's information that has to get out, but you can't have two characters telling each other things they already know. <laughs> they just can't do it. You know? <laughs> because you don't do it in real life. <laughs> right. You don't do, do it in real life. Um, so, you know, they can't sit there and say, uh, you knew Mr. Williams and you didn't. You, well, yeah, I knew Mr. Williams and you knew Mr. Williams. Yeah, we both knew. It. Yeah, it's like you can't do that. It's <laughs> <laughs> but we've seen movies. We've both seen movies that does that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Without question. So, or it can be a character telling the character something he doesn't know, but it's just a bunch of setup information that is not really a scene. 
between two people, you know, <laughs> you can't do that either. So um, it's, it's, it's difficult to find a way to get information out with characters behaving naturally as they would in real life. That is the job of the screenwriter. That's why, that's why they get paid well when eventually they get paid. <laughs> 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 so um, the, uh, what is the best advice you can give to a screenwriter just starting out today? Well, I mean, um, if you're starting out, then that's, that's actually what you're doing. You're starting, so you should be writing like a maniac because you're passionate, you love writing, right? So you should be doing it, writing one script after another. I mean, the advice I give to somebody who's actually going to write their first script is write your first script all the way through. Don't stop. Don't go back and revise while you're in the middle of it. You can make notes. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. But write four words only to the words the end. Write the whole first draft. I say that because I want to prevent people from rewriting act one for the rest of their life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I've been in editing for a long time. I, I know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> and then I say, put that script aside. You wrote a rough draft, put it aside. No, can't touch it. No, write a second screenplay and write that one all the way through with only writing forward, no going back, all the way to the end and put that second script aside. Write a third script, same thing, all the way through to the end. You can make notes, but you can't go back and revise. Put the third script away and take the first one out. Now, you're a better writer. You're a better writer just for having written three scripts. You're going to approach the first script as a better writer. You're going to look at it more objectively because you haven't been looking at it for a while and your head has been in two different screenplays. Now you're going to go back and have a more masterful view of what should be done to that first script. And then you're going to apply the same thing when you go again to the second and the third script. It's great. That is probably some of the best screenwriting advice I've ever heard. And I've I, seriously, it's like so simple, but yet so powerful and so just basic. You know, like well, you, thanks. I yeah, it's um, you write three screenplays, you're going to be a better writer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, that's that's part of it too. We were talking about education classes and all that. But if but what I just said is one way that you're already making yourself a better writer on your own, just by yourself. That's really and it, and it's something that you know, I preach from the top of the indie film hustle uh, mountain here that it's about work and about showing up every day. As as Woody yeah. Allen says, 90% of success is just showing up. <laughs> right. Well, that's the same thing with just type. That's exactly the same thing. Just type. Just keep writing. And I know a lot of screenwriters who are still like, I've been on my screenplay for a year. I'm like, Jesus, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> Jesus, you got it. But what you've just said makes perfect. That's the difference between someone who's just going to be stuck in this one script for seven years or someone who's going to build a career. At least – have 30 scripts to go shop around and probably well, out of those 30 scripts maybe two or three of them are, are something that could be shopped well another thing I want, I want someone to get past about that three scripts, write three scripts thing is um, emotionally people can put a lot of expectation on the first script mm. I'm writing a script and now I want it to sell or get an agent or whatever and all that stuff is swirling around in the person's head so if they drop it after the first draft and go to a second screenplay, they've broken that cycle of having so much need for the first script to do everything for them and make their entire career happen. You know, it's the it's what I call the home run derby. Is yeah. you, you you only think you're going to go up to bat once, and you're gonna and you have to hit a home run, and if you miss and you strike out, well that's it as opposed to concentrating on hitting singles cuz right singles will eventually turn into home runs you know you will get you will get on base and you'll score 
But because of all the singles you've hit, every once in a while, they'll throw that pitch the right way and boom, you hit it out of the park. Well, that's really good. That is, yes, I like that analogy a lot. I, I, that's, I just actually I said that the other day on a podcast because I was like, guys, you got to stop this home run mentality because I've been in that home run mentality. And the funny thing is that you, what you're just saying now about screenwriting, I've, I've, I, I've started to do, but with directing. And I know that sounds crazy, but I have... I've always had the same problem. I've been stuck on trying to make my first feature for 20 years. Mind you, the technology is changing. Now it's much more affordable. But um, now I've, I just said, screw it. I'm just going to make my first movie. And I already have two other ones lined up. And I'm just going to keep shooting because I'm going to keep them at a certain budget level where I can keep shooting. And every day I shoot, I learn something new. And I'm doing it all myself. And it's all coming out great and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and you just got to keep doing it. And you're not putting all those eggs in that pressure on the one movie or the okay. one well, That's great what you're doing. Yeah, that's great. You know, right. it's it's something you have to do and I think that uh, it's uh, it's great advice. I mean, that's seriously some of the greatest advice of sc- for a screenwriter I've ever heard and I've had a lot of people on the show and, and it's like just write three screenplays straight and don't go back and then after the third one go back to the first one and you'll be a better screenwriter. It's just, that's really, really... The, the best advice is always the simplest, I find. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. But, but you know, I'm... One of my uh, one of the things I like to impart is you know how much a person can learn on their own, um, I, and I'm not dissuading from taking a screenwriting course or anything. But like the screenwriter toolbox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want you to take my course. Of course. Go, go to Creative Live and get my uh, course. I will give you the but, link. <laughs> but um, I, I like I like ways that writers can learn on their own and get better on their own. That's an important part of it. Um, so. And it looks like that's what you're doing with directing as well. So well, I think also, that's helpful. And it's also what Robert Rodriguez did before he made El Mariachi. He's like, I did 30 short films. They were bad. <laughs> and I just kept doing them and doing them and doing them. I got all the bad crap out of my way. And then I went off and did El Mariachi and then just kept going. But you need to get that bad stuff out. It's like your first script, which a lot of screenwriters think, like, my first script's going to win the Oscar. I'm like, that's extremely rare. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's extremely. I don't know if it's happened. I'm sure it has happened. Like you know, the first guy. Well, I mean, what was the um, usual suspects? I'm not sure if he that was his first script, but I know there's 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 some cases to be said that there was a screenwriter who first script was like you know amazing. But generally speaking, that's the lottery ticket. Uh, generally speaking, for the rest of us mortals, it takes time to develop our craft. Right. right. So, so what is um, the last? These are the questions I ask all my. Um, all my guests. So what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in life or in the film business? Um, The lesson that took the longest, it was most important. And it was a tough one to finally really, really learn is to be, have your mind in the process and not in the result. (laughs) Don't be obsessed about the result. Just stay in the process because it may not get made. It may not happen. That's not what you're supposed to be thinking about. That's what, dis- that's what causes ulcers. That's what causes anxiety, <laughs> right? Be in the process. And it did take a long time for me to get away from constantly be th- thinking about the result rather than the process. It's, uh, it's enjoy the journey, not the destination. Right. Basically. Well, don't obsess about the destination. <laughs> you get there eventually. Right, yeah. right, right. <laughs> so what are your three favorite films of all time in any order or, or any kind of films that just tickle your fancy at the moment? Well, I mean, that's, that's a really, really difficult question for mm-hmm. me because I like so many and it, the, the span of going to films from the past, mm-hmm. the, the deep past, international films, it's just... Let's say domestic. Really difficult for me to answer, but I, I can say that certainly one of them is Doctor Strangelove. Oh, cool. uh, it had a profound impact on me because of the tone. The tone is nearly impossible. It's it's it's, it's ridiculous. One of the greatest tones of a movie, yeah, it's ever been achieved, and I think that's the most difficult thing, element of a movie to achieve is the tone of it, and I then became obsessed with writing reality-based characters in a mix of comedy and drama or suspense or, or whatever it is. 
as a style. It, that really impacted me. Dr. Strangelove. Oh, anything Kubrick. I mean, I'm a huge, yeah. huge, huge, huge oh, Kubrick fan. It's like I could just, then I could start naming directors or I could start naming countries. And I mean, so, just, so which director, so, so if, if you can't name two other movies, what are two directors who just, you know, blow up your skirt? <laughs> well, in all honesty, I have to say David Fincher is one of them. I mean, yeah. and I know that's not the same as somebody viewing their work only because mm-hmm. I did work with him, mm-hmm. but. Also viewing his work, <laughs> you know. I mean, he's he and uh, Kubrick and um, and Spielberg, who has this way of. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. You he pulls you so in that you just believe whatever he wants you to believe. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's just amazing. Um, so, I mean, I, I could go on with directors. It's like, that's, you know. Scorsese. I mean, and, yeah, and, Scorsese. My God, that was a big, Mean Streets was also a huge influence on me in terms of uh, tone and, and the way characters can behave and it can be funny and it can be scary. And I mean, just, and that applies to his other movies as well. Oh, good fellas. Uh, I mean, and certainly Taxi Driver and Raging Bull are like, you know, it's uh, uh, wow. You're just on a tight wire of anything, you know, it could, it's dangerous, funny, scary, uh, exciting. It's, you know, so yeah, Martin Scorsese is way up there. I mean, that's the that's why I don't like to list because I'm going to leave somebody out in the God. moment. You know what I mean? <laughs> Fair or I'm going to leave a movie out in the moment. And, um, yeah, I mean, we, we we could sit down and just geek out about movies and uh, for 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 days, I'm sure. <laughs> right, right. I mean, and Orson Welles, you know, certainly is a uh, is another major favorite of mine. And when you saw Mean Streets, I mean, you saw it when it came out. Like I saw Mean Streets later no, on. No, I, I, I saw it um, later. Oh, you saw it later? Yeah, I saw it later. Okay, so it was, uh, but it was still when it's hard for people to feel like when you see Mean Streets, like. At the moment, that was something really, like, out there. Something like Easy Rider. Like, you know, you look at Easy right. Rider now, and you're like, oh, that's that's kind of okay. Or Blade, R- or Blade Runner. You're like, oh, that's that looks nice. But, but like, when that came out, <laughs> there was nothing like it. <laughs> yeah, mind-blowing. But, mind-blowing. I mean, I still think it is, but, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, I could, I mean I, I'll put up Blade Runner against, I mean, many things going on today. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> many, many, many movies. So, uh, Jim, where can people find you? Um, well, not your personal home address, just uh, online. <laughs> uh, I have to really clarify. I've had a few guests go, um, what? I'm like, no, like online. <laughs> right. Right. I don't have my own website, but, um, I, uh, on Twitter, I'm whoa, ho, Jack, W O H O J A K. Okay. You're going to get a lot of stalkers now. I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, you know, I've, it's Twitter. I'm used to it. It's everybody else is used to it. So there you go. <laughs> do you have a Facebook page? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, uh, just under my my own name. All right. I'll put the links to uh, where you can find Jib and his personal home address in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't find me there, though. That's a problem. <laughs> exactly. You're always all over the place. Jim, man, thank you so much for for this has been a, an absolute joy uh, and pleasure talking to you. So thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank you. It's been great talking to you too, Alex. Really terrific, terrific uh, conversation. Thank you, my friend. You. <laughs> Thanks. I told you. I told you. I mean, that was a, such a fun. Uh, you have no idea what a thrill it was for me to be interviewing Jim Wools. I mean, uh, you know, as a kid growing up watching Fight Club. And, and, you know, and, and studying and analyzing Fight Club over the years, uh, it is such a thrill uh, having him on the show. And he brought the goods and then some. Uh, that piece of advice, write those three screenplays, is, I mean, seriously, as simple as that sounds, guys, it is kind of the basis of everything. And, uh, and, and I'm glad he liked my analogy of the home runs because I really do think that's a lot of times what filmmakers and screenwriters do is they put all that pressure on that first movie or that first screenplay and when it doesn't go they get discouraged and they fall out and i just want to say something on the side note guys 
you know, as as you guys are listening to this because you are a creative artist, you are content makers in one way, shape, or form, whether that be a writer or a filmmaker uh, or an artist. And it is your responsibility as an artist to succeed. Now, I know that sounds weird, but you have a responsibility to the world to get your voice out there, all right? Because you have no idea, like I said before, you have no idea the impact your work as an artist could have on another human being. You have no idea. And I do speak from experience with this, with what I've done with Indie Film Hustle and with my past films and what I've done in the past. You can change the course of one person's life that could change the course of many other lives. So it's your responsibility, whether it's making a song, whether it's writing a movie, making a movie, creating a YouTube channel, putting up content. You have no idea what the impact of your art will be. So, God damn it, it's your responsibility. So get to it, will you? And stop messing around. <laughs> so as promised, I was going to give you guys a link to Jim's amazing course called the Screenwriter's Toolkit. So all you got to do is go to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash toolkit. That's IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash toolkit. And you'll take you right to Jim's course. And if I were you, I would definitely pick it up. It is really, really, really cool. So now, guys, if you want to be part of the Indie Film Syndicate, which is our amazing filmmaking community that we've created that is flourishing and we're talking and helping filmmakers out in the community, it's really, really amazing. And they're getting access to a ton of stuff that uh, that I've been able to put up there as far as courses are concerned on screenwriting, on filmmaking, on distribution, on film festivals, on all sorts of great, great things on cameras and cinematography and so on and new content going up every month, and of course, the micro-budget film, a feature film masterclass, which is analyzing This Is Meg as I make it, you definitely should check it out, guys. IndieFilmSyndicate.com. And I will be opening up in the next few weeks after I'm done shooting This Is Meg, but we're going to have a, uh, a small window where you can have lifetime access to the membership, to the community, for one flat rate. So that is something coming up in the next few weeks. So definitely keep an eye out for that. But definitely, guys, check it out, IndieFilmSyndicate.com. As for the coming weeks, I've been stockpiling a ton of amazing interviews with great filmmakers like Diane Bell, who won Sundance. And we go through the entire what happened to her and her crazy ride, a roller coaster ride at, you know, actually being in Sundance and winning Sundance. And as far and a bunch of other new guests coming up very, very soon, as well as some more hard hitting raw episodes of some subject matters that I think need to be discussed. So uh, they might be coming up uh, very soon. So keep an eye out or an ear out for that. Please, guys, share this information with as many people as you can. Okay, I want to help as many people. I want this information to get out to as many artists and as many filmmakers, as many screenwriters as as I can because I really hope what we're doing here at Indie Film Hustle can help the world a bit. I know that's grandiose, but help the world a bit and help create some good art that can hopefully change the way things are in the in, in the world. I know that sounds foo-foo. <laughs> oh, that hippie from L.A. But, uh, but in all honesty, I really do hope that. So please share Every episode you can, or the episodes that move you or touch you, of course, just send them always, always to IndieFilmHustle.com. And if you really love the podcast and love the content that we're creating, head over to FilmmakingPodcast.com and leave us a good review, hopefully. That really helps out our ranking and helps us out uh, to get the uh, show uh, seen by more and more people. So thanks again. The show notes for this episode are at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 089 and have links to everything me and Jim talked about in the episode. And as a treat, I will leave you today with the philosophy of life by the one, the only, Tyler Durden. Keep that hustle going, keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. You know, man, it could be worse. A woman could cut off your penis while you're sleeping and toss it out the window of a moving car. It's always that. I don't know, it's just... When you buy furniture, you tell yourself, that's it, that's the last sofa I'm gonna need. Whatever else happens, 
got that sofa problem handled. I had it all. I had a therapy that was very decent, a wardrobe that was getting very respectable, close to being complete. Shit, man, now it's all gone. All gone. <clears throat> all gone. You know what a duvet is? Comfort. It's a blanket. Just a blanket. Now, why do guys like you and I know what a duvet is? It's essential to our survival? In the hunter-gatherer sense of the word? No. Catch me. I could be wrong. Maybe it's a terrible tragedy. No, it's just, it's just stuff. Well, you did lose a lot of versatile solutions for modern living. Fuck, you're right. No, no, it's... Oh, my, my insurance is probably gonna cover it. So. What? Things you own end up owning you. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.